Thank you, uh, Professor Fuhrman, for the interesting lecture. Now we better understand the connection with research, governance, and decision making. But next time we'll bring the decision makers to hear it. Hopefully they will adopt it. Uh, I'm always wondering who is the man who is going to count all the species around the world and give, give us the numbers. As you know, Israel is a very populated country and it's going to be one of the most populated countries in the Western world very soon in this uh, rate. But also Israel is very rich for uh, species per square meter. The next lecture will be given by a professor in, from Duke University. Professor Pim is a recipient of many international, international awards and important prizes. His main interest is in the field of biodiversity and conversation biology, conservation biology. Uh, Pim's experience lies in species extinctions and what can be done to prevent them. The title of his talk is How Many Species Are There? Also in Israel, tell me how many, we don't know. Every year we have a new one. Where are they hiding? How fast are they going to extinct? Hopefully not. And what can we do about it? Thank you very much. I understand that I stand between you and a reception. I want to thank Tamar for giving me the opportunity to come and visit Israel and Palestine. And obviously, like everybody else, I want to promote my book. <laughs> I want to address really four questions. How many species are they? Where are they? How fast are they going extinct? And what we can do about it? And I'm going to focus on solutions. Alas, I'm going to focus on solutions for warm, wet parts of the world. I have a warm, wet floor that I'm standing on. <laughs> so I better not touch anything that is electric. <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, really <laughs> no water now. And I don't have time to talk about how many species of everything, everything there are. So I just want to give an example, an example from flowering plants. It's illustrative in, in a number of ways. Sounds like my grandson, Akiva. Um, um, if we're going to understand how many species there are, and it's the first step of, uh, of knowing you know, where they are. We have to get over the problems that taxonomists cause us. Taxonomists have this really bad, unsociable habit of giving the same name to, I mean, many names to the same species. <laughs> That's synonymy. But they also have an incomplete taxonomic catalog and I'm going to suggest at least one solution to that, which is to view taxonomists as animals and study their social behavior and their population <laughs> dynamics. Um, bless the botanists. The botanists have done exactly what Ava suggested they should do. They have come together um, and, and developed international collaborations so that they can, in fact, sort out their mess. We have a complete catalogue of monocots now that's taxonomically revised. And the groups that were formerly known as dicots, the non-monocots, they are working their way through that. And so we can look at the rates at which species are being described. And the basic idea is that as the taxonomic catalog becomes more complete, there are fewer unknown species, 
and the more you have, the harder it is to get new ones. I'm going to investigate that very phenomenon on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when I go bird watching. Um, I have a list of the 49 species, actually it's 44 species now, that I have not seen in Israel. Well, it's a great idea, the notion that there's sort of a law of diminishing returns. And the problem is, it fails badly. Because if you look at the rates of species descriptions, please note that the scale of the y-axis is a logarithmic one. Turns out that the rate of species description of flowering plants is not only increasing, but has, for the last 50 or 60 years, been increasing exponentially. The problem is that taxonomists are increasing exponentially too. I don't know what they do in their museums, but I mean, in an intellectual sense, they breed. <laughs> so we have to correct for taxonomic effort. And when you do that, um, you do indeed find that the number of species per taxonomist is declining and has been declining oh, for, for 150 years or so. And it's that rate at which species per taxonomist is declining that allows you to fit the curve at the bottom, which corrects also for sort of increasing taxonomic efficiency and a variety of other things. And you can use that to predict how many, how many species remain. You can, you can predict when taxonomy will end. The answer, this is a great concern of mine because, um, I, as I've often said, I wouldn't want my elder daughter to marry a plant taxonomist because one plant taxonomist in the family is enough uh, and she's a plant taxonomist. So I want to make sure that my daughter has you know, enough plants to describe for a career. It's a sort of fatherly advice that one, you know, one should give one's children. Um, and the answer is, she's okay, she works on monocots, uh, and there's going to be a 17% increase in the number of monocot species, we predict, and about a 13% in the families formerly known as dicots. And we can go through this and look at family-by-family family estimates, and by and large, it, it, it sort of matches what, what the experts in the field says. Now, there are clearly some groups of uh, organisms where um, the likely total numbers of species are many, many times what we have now. But for plants, it looks as if the taxonomic catalogue is reasonably complete. Um, it's been completed at a reasonable rate. Um, and, and our knowledge is, you know, is, is, is not bad. But of course, the issue is one of asking where they are. Because I'm particularly concerned to know whether they are in harm's way. If those missing, let's say, 15% of all species, are they in the places that we care about? Are they in the places that we are trying to predict? Um, are they um, um, in, in the places where we haven't thought there might be a lot of species at risk? Well, I, what I want to do is to introduce you to what I call the laws of biodiversity. Uh, my friend and colleague Ian called these patterns, which is a word which we English pronounce very different from we Americans. So Americans, if I was using my American accent, which is really terrible, I would call it pattern. Um, and I call these laws. And absolutely, the most incredible law of biodiversity was formulated in an extraordinarily crisp paper that Alfred Russell Wallace wrote from the island of Sarawak, um, where he nails the laws, and I do mean it this way, the laws of evolution. He nails the patterns that we have to explain. Each species came into existence coexistence in time and space with other similar species. 
We don't have polar bears in the Arctic, Tibet, and Antarctica. We don't have dinosaurs in the Cambrian, the Jurassic, uh, and the Eocene. So those, that was the patterns of the biogeography. It was an incredibly important paper. Of course, as you well know, Victorian England um, totally ignored him, so the next time he had a really great paper, he sent it to some chap that he thought might help him, uh, called Charles Darwin. The next law is that for geographical ranges, the term on average is a poor description, that species don't have an average range size. They have a few species with huge ranges, and an enormous number of species with very tiny ranges. The next law, I don't have a really nice way to summarize it, so if you'll pardon my French, Mother Nature is a bitch. <laughs> Mother Nature is really unkind. You'd think that species with small ranges would at least be common within them. The reality is, that species with large ranges are common, um, and species with small ranges tend to be rare within those ranges. And then, species vary from place to place. We saw some patterns from, 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 from Ian. I'm going to show you the same graphs, except my, you'll feel as if you put your glasses on with mine. These were a bit blurred and fuzzy, which was probably a consequence of him and his graduate students spending too much time in the pub. Tropical forests have, have more species than, than tropical deserts. But what about the small range species? We shall see that they are not everywhere. You might think that if you have more species, you'd have more big range species, more middle sized ranges, more little ranges. In fact, small range species are um, in idiosyncratic places. They are geographically concentrated, and they're concentrated in places that are different from where the big range species are. And all of those things are not merely the laws of biodiversity, but they are guiding principles in effective, practical conservation. What you can do is you can line up species from those with the smallest geographical range to the largest geographical range. If you do that for the world's 6,000 amphibians or so, you find that 10,000 square kilometers is about the median range size. Half of all the world's amphibians have ranges smaller than about 10,000 square kilometers. The interesting thing about these graphs is, other than the fact that the lines are in different places, they all are all broadly of the same shape. You notice there's a log scale at the bottom. Marine organisms, we now know, follow the same laws that, as Nancy so, so very interestingly pointed out, when you start doing the taxonomy of marine organisms well, you find there's an enormous number of marine organisms that have really tiny ranges. And as we shall see, tiny range size means a vulnerability to extinction. Lots of species. Another way to put this is to look at the ratio between the average range size, which is, of course, a number greatly influenced by those few species with huge ranges. Um, and the median range size, the range size that has 50% of the species below it. For, um, for mammals in the New World, that ratio is 7 to 1. For amphibians, it's 40 to 1. There are amphibian species with huge geographical ranges, essentially all over North America, all over the Palearctic. And then an extraordinary number of these species with very, very tiny ranges, like this beautiful colored frog that you have just rediscovered. The bird on the left is one of the rarest birds in, in the Americas. I mounted several expeditions to look for it. 
I got left by a helicopter which was supposed to come back and pick me up after four days and it never came back and I wouldn't have taken a helicopter to get there had it been easy to go there by foot. Um, it has one of the smallest ranges of birds in the New World and it's rare within that range. The bird on the right occurs essentially all over South and Central America and everybody has one. It's a very abundant bird pretty much wherever you find it. So now let's look at the distribution of, of species. This is a rather odd looking map. It's inspired by something that we Americans do not understand called football. And I was very glad that, um, was it Ava who showed a map of a football? Um, I, I really appreciate you doing that. You may recall that footballs, at least old fashioned footballs, are mixes of pentagons and hexagons. And if you map the world onto a football, uh, uh, that's a soccer ball for the, uh, for the Americans in the audience. Um, you can get, and open it up, you get this rather interesting looking map which preserves the area relationships. There's an awful lot of South America, there's an awful lot of Africa, there's a lot of the tropics. And as you can see, the greatest variety of species are in, you know, are in the tropics, particularly the tropical moist forests. But there's another way of thinking about that map. I've shown at the left a bird distributions for all of the species of birds in the New World. But the map at the right has half the number of species of birds in the New World, but it's the half that has the smaller geographical range sizes. And it looks very, very different. It's not, you know, a pale imitation of the map on the left. It's a fundamentally different map. And it shows that species with small geographical ranges are concentrated into special, odd, bizarre places. And of course that notion is the one embedded by my colleague Norman Meyer's idea of biodiversity hotspots. There are a bunch of regions around the world, uh, 25 of them, and those areas in total comprise about 10% of the Earth's area, but they house at least 50% of the world's species. So species with small geographical ranges are concentrated. Most of those places, oh incidentally if you're looking at this map, I've taken a football and sat upon it and squashed it flat. Um, there's a political reason for doing this. Uh, I've been fortunate to win international awards for my biodiversity work. I have never been put on the list of the 100 most dangerous academics in America. And so I was, I'm preparing myself for a, um, a Romney, uh, Michelle Bachman um, uh, administration, and, and I feel that if I, if I have maps that show the world like it is, especially with the United States lying on its side, that that will qualify me for one of the most hundred dangerous academics in America. Um, you will notice that Israel is one of these biodiversity hotspots. You live in a part of the world that has um, unusual concentrations of species with small geographical ranges. Now, the obvious question, given that we are missing 15% of the world's plants, is how will knowing all of the plants change our perspectives of hotspots? Might it be that suddenly Europe, which sits at the very bottom of the biodiversity league tables, and Britain, which is indeed, as Ian pointed out, an island that I've called a cold, damp place. Damp is so much more pejorative than cold a cold, damp place off the coast of France. I mean, might it be that there are really, you know, lots of undiscovered species in Britain 
you know, Ian has fantasies about that at night, but we really don't want to go there. <laughs> well, the answer is if you predict using the same statistical model where the missing species are, you find it's, you know, it's in Central America, it's in coastal Brazil, it's in Madagascar, it's in Southern Africa, it's in New Guinea. It's basically in the biodiversity hotspots. We're worried, in and incidentally the Mediterranean too, the biodiversity hotspots are where the missing species of plant are, um, which means we've identified the right regions. The, the bad news is that you know, hotspots are even hotter in terms of threatened species than we thought they were. If we look at this region, if you look at the sort of um, temperate Eurasia, um, you can see that we're predicting that sort of the, the, the Middle Eastern Mediterranean, I mean broadly this region, we can't do this quite country by country, and not enough data. Um, but we're suggesting that perhaps 30% of the species, plant species remain to be discovered in this region. This, remember, is based on the rates of plant descriptions and how those rates are dropping. They're not dropping very fast, which means there's a lot of plant species to be discovered, um, which suggests that, yes, there's a lot of taxonomy to be done here, uh, and that, I think, is an important message for, you know, for this uh, conference and this week. Um, we need to do a lot more taxonomy in this region. There's a lot of undiscovered species. Plants are reasonably well known. There's going to be insect groups where the, the ratio of what we know to what we don't know is going to be even greater. And now I want to talk about how fast species are going extinct. When you hear Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth talk about species going extinct a hundred to a thousand times faster than they should, or you read about it in the, uh, in the first figure of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. If you've ever wondered from whom Al Gore and the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment got those numbers, the answer is from me. And I've chosen to tell you that because I'm feeling unloved because people rarely bother to read the bloody fine print. Um, I chose to express extinctions as extinctions per million species years. That's years times species for a really good political reason. If you say three or 30 or 300 species are going extinct per day, um, those numbers are actually the same they're based on whether you think there's a million species or 10 million species or 100 million species. But even if you say three species are going extinct per day, you are vulnerable to politicians who turn to you and say, name one. And if you can't, you're sunk. So I wanted to express extinction rates as a, in a relative way. And, and we can do that, it requires a little bit of effort, but I hope you'll bear with me. For birds, you can look at when bird species were described and if they became extinct, when they became extinct. By about 1790, we had about 1,500 species of birds that were known. Um, and 25 years later, we said we had essentially the same number. There was almost no increase in taxonomy. The reason was that we British were out there beating up the French and making sure that we had world domination. But once we had world domination, taxonomy could begin again. And it did in 1815, and by uh, 1899, we had about 7,500 species of birds. So you have to look what happened to those 7,000 odd species of birds in the subsequent 100 and however it's been years, 111 years. So you take that cohort of um, 7,000 species, you look at it over the next 100 years, and, and you ask, you know, how many extinctions did you have? 
And in that particular example, I've shown you there were 39 extinctions. Many of the bird extinctions that we know about happened uh, um, before the species were described. Think, think of the dodo. You know, Linnaeus knew about the dodo, but it was already extinct when he described it. So you've got to follow a cohort. This is a standard technique of population um, dynamics analysis, so it ought not to be unfamiliar. So we can see that the, the one estimate that I've highlighted here suggests, you know, 55 extinctions per million species years. Um, some of those species have only survived because of very, very intensive conservation efforts, conservation efforts unlikely to be afforded to ever any other taxon besides birds because we love birds so much. So this is where these estimates of, you know, very roughly 100 extinctions per million species years come from. The, the paper that, that, that kicked this metric off has a bunch of estimates and they cluster around 100 extinctions per million species years. The problem then is what happens in the future, you know, the, and the future is notoriously difficult to predict. Well, one criticism is that extinctions in the past have been birds on islands. You know, the Oxford English Dictionary says of the dodo, it went extinct. You know, dodos are stupid birds that live on islands. It doesn't say the Dutch bludgeoned the poor bloody dodos into oblivion. Um, you know, it puts the blame on the dodo. The important thing to notice in this graph is two things. One of them is that the smaller the geographical range size, the much more likely a species is to be threatened with extinction. But once one corrects for range size, species on islands are actually less likely to be threatened than species on mainlands. And that's because species on mainlands, if they have small range sizes, tend to be really very rare within those ranges. So there's an enormous number of very vulnerable species on continents with small ranges and rare within those ranges. And that is the population of species through which extinction will unfold. Let's look at the damage we're doing to the environment. This is a map of where tropical moist forests were in the Americas, in red, and where they remain in green. You can see that Central America and the Caribbean and the, particularly the coastal forests of Brazil, the Mata Atlantica, those areas have lost substantial amounts of forest. So if you take the map of deforestation at the middle top, you combine that with that map of where small ranged species are, you take the threats and you combine it with the, um, uh, with the vulnerabilities, you come up in your mind's eye with a recognition that places like the coastal forests of Brazil ought to be where the greatest number of threatened species are to be found, and indeed you can map them, and I have at the left, and you see that coastal Brazil is within the Americas a, a hotspot. It's a place where there's a lot of species at risk because of habitat destruction. It's followed by the Caribbean and the Northern Andes. Um, I'm not someone who works in Mediterranean ecosystems, but you can make the extension. Mediterranean ecosystems, including here, have a lot of small range species, a lot of habitat destruction. That's what leads to concentrations of threatened species. And that's what it looks like. That's what coastal Brazil looks like. It's a lot of little forest islands. So the question is, what happens to species in forest islands. There is a theory called the theory of island biogeography. And it tells us that there is a remarkably good relationship between the area of an island and the number of species it contains. In fact, there are two relationships 
There's the relationship for isolated islands. And there's a relationship for subsets of habitat that are nested continuously within a larger habitat. So if you go to a large extent of forest and you look at how many species there will be in, in a square kilometer, 10 square kilometers, 100 square kilometers, 1,000 square kilometers of continuous forest, that relationship is a very, very shallow slope. 100 square kilometers of eastern North America will have essentially all of the species of birds of eastern North America. But make it into an island and the prediction is that um, eventually, in time, it will adopt the island relationship. And so the small fragments will have very many fewer species. That is the prediction. So it looks like this. The species area relationship for islands suggests that if you lose 50% of your forest, that you will lose 15% of your species. If you go to eastern North America, and we Europeans arrived in about 1620, we started moving inland, and there was a wave of deforestation, such that New England, for example, was very extensively deforested by about... Um, uh, you know, 18, 1820, 1830, 1840, the, the graphs that we saw of Wisconsin with that problem, that effect, but moved a little bit later because people also moved as a wave ever further westward. To cut a long story short, at the low point of, of forest cover in North America, which was about 1870, about half the forest remained. So eastern North America should have lost half of its forest, put that into the formula, it should have lost 15% of its species. There's about 160 species of forest bird in eastern North America. You can go to your field guide and check. And that suggests, you know, 15% of 160, it ought to have been 32 species lost. So how many species disappeared. We know from John James Audubon, who went out collecting biodiversity with the latest technology of the age, his shotgun, we know that we've only lost four species and one is teetering on the brink of extinction. So why there is there a discrepancy? There is a discrepancy because we haven't applied the calculation to the right species. There is a new movie out, it's called The Lorax. I don't know how many of you have got small kids, but when my two daughters were growing up, I read The Lorax to them every night to the point where I can start it at the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and I can go to the end without needing the book. In The Lorax, there is an evil character, um, we now call them, you know, Republicans. <laughs> and it imagines somebody who clears all of the forest. So supposing that we had cleared all of the forest from eastern North America, how many species would have gone extinct? That's like asking how many species are endemic to eastern North America. And the answer is 30. Those are the only species at risk of going globally extinct. Some of them might have gone locally extinct, and indeed some did. But we're talking about global extinctions. This is just a subset. So 15% of 30 is 4.5, and that's exactly the right answer. What you would have expected to happen in eastern North America with 30 endemic species is you would have expected those species to have lost habitat, dropped below the minimum viable population for survival, just as the mechanisms underlying the species area curve predict. And we predict 
Four species to go extinct and you know, one to be teetering on the brink. It's a kind of numerical precision in my work that drives Dan's symbol off to distraction. If we extend those calculations to, um, to species as a whole, as Peter Raven and I did in a, in a paper in Nature a few years back, um, we, can, we can predict that probably a quarter of all species will be driven to extinction by these habitat loss mechanisms, even if we do not destroy any more habitat than we have already destroyed. What these results do not tell you is how fast those extinctions unfold. You know, an island is a, has relaxed to its lower numbers of species over long periods of time. Well, I want to look at this in a particular context. I want to go to the Atlantic Coast forests of Brazil. It's a place with an extraordinary number of threatened species. And do we, can we predict how many species should be threatened, not extinct yet, but threatened, on the basis of the species area predictions? And the answer is yes. The species area predictions give you a strikingly good quantitative prediction of how many species should be teetering on the brink of extinction. It does not tell you how long it's going to be before they go extinct. That's what the landscape looks like when you map out where those threatened species are. We've now gone from these glorious global maps that both Ian and I have presented, we've gone to regional areas, then we've draped maps trimmed by the elevational preferences of the species and also whether there's any forest there. We don't plot species if there's no forest. So these are the forest species. And when you look at that landscape, this is about 150 kilometers from east to west. It's just east of the city of Rio de Janeiro. You see that the greatest concentration of threatened species is in a series of forest islands um, off to the, to the right-hand side of the graph. And that is where extinction is most likely to happen. If you're going to do something practical about biodiversity loss in the Americas, that's the front line. We know a great deal about the dynamics of how forest patches lose species from a 35-year-long experiment initially started by Tom Lovejoy, the BDFFP, north of Manaus. A series of forest fragments that were created when, when Fagenda's cattle farms were created. The basic Lovejoy idea is you count the number of species before the forest is cut and then over, over 35 years, you follow the rate at which species drop out of forest fragments. We can do that for Manaus with the Lovejoy project. We can also do it for a very special example of tropical forest in Kenya at Kakamega. And what one gets is a remarkably good, uh, again, quantitative relationship between the half-life of the relaxation and the size of the forest fragment. By the half-life, I mean the time it takes to lose half the species. A forest fragment of, 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 of a few hectares loses half of its species within a few years. You have to get up to 100 hectares a square kilometer to, to be able to retain your species for a few decades. You need forest fragments of thousands of hectares if you're going to have any chance of retaining most of the species in the long term. And that relationship gives us an immediate management recommendation for how we stop extinctions in coastal Brazil. We want to ensure that those fragments, which are small, do not remain small. What can we do about it? What we can do is to prevent the fragmentation of the landscapes around us. 
what we can do about it has a financial aspect. We need money. And the first thing we need to recognize is that there is indeed a financial incentive to prevent forest loss. Forests, tropical forests, have about 150 tons of carbon in them per hectare. Converting tropical forests in my lifetime has put a staggering amount of carbon into the atmosphere, and that's not a good idea. So the first thing we ought to be doing is stopping the problem. And the international community have, with very few exceptions, come in very strongly in favor of what is called RED, reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. All too often when you go to meetings at the UN, and, and I'm actually in that photograph in the center middle, it was when that photograph was taken, I was really quite embarrassed because I didn't realize I was getting bald at the back of my head. So I'm that balding head in the middle. Um, world leaders all agree that red is a good idea. The developed nations like red, it's a cheap way of taking care of their carbon emissions. Developing countries like red because it means they get some money. So, is red happening? And the answer is yes. And if there are any Norwegians in the audience, we should hug them. You know, if you haven't hugged a Norwegian today, you should try and find one. <laughs> because what Norway um, has done is to, is to provide a billion dollars worth of funding to Brazil. And what Brazil has done in exchange um, is to drop its deforestation rate from 20,000 square kilometers a year to under about three or 4,000. I had the opportunity to interview Carlos Mink, the Brazil environment minister. I asked him, basically, how did you do it? Um, and his interesting first answer was, good science. Um, this was something that was made possible by the fact that Brazil has a very, very large community of very competent remote sensors who are able to figure out exactly where deforestation is taking place. The billion dollars didn't go to the science, you know, we can all wish. Um, it went to, to law enforcement. So stopping deforestation is the first thing we need to do. But the second thing is we need to restore habitats. We, we need to restore the connections between habitats. And we can do that because those degraded habitats will soak up somewhere between 5 and 10 tons of carbon per year. And if you have a price of carbon that's, I don't know, $10 a ton, that gives you a rent for growing carbon that might well be higher than the rent for growing cattle on really bad land. The greatest species diversity is found in the tropical moist forests of the world. And bird species are an example of this with high concentrations of birds in the Amazon tropical Africa, Southeast Asia. The greatest number of threatened species, however, is where geographical small ranges collide with excessive deforestation. A good example of this is the coastal forests of Brazil. We can map out in some considerable detail where those species are likely to live. This particular image uh, plots the remaining forest against elevation and color codes the image by how many threatened species remain in these places. All of these images are courtesy of my colleague Clinton Jenkins. If we want to understand why there are so many threatened species here, one can look at the remote sensing. This is a landscape that is extraordinarily fragmented. These patches of forest, tiny and isolated, contain the largest number of threatened species in the Americas. The obvious question is what we can do about this. When faced with these images, I felt that 
everything we know about the loss of biodiversity from fragments suggests that the most effective conservation action would be to reconnect those fragments. As we close in on this image, the quality of the grazing land here is all too obvious. You can see the brown lateritic soils shining through. This is extremely bad land. Bad land, of course, means that it's cheap to purchase. It can grow carbon cheaper than it can grow cattle. The need to reconnect these patches is not just limited to birds. The area on the right is Hevio Yunyao, a nature reserve, and it's the home to the golden lion tamarin, a charismatic little monkey um, that has been rescued from the very brink of extinction. The tamarins want to go forth and multiply, and to do that they have to cross this gap. And what you're seeing now is how this gap has changed in the years since my group, Saving Species, purchased the land. You can see that that gap is becoming greener. In this image, it's quite clearly a lot greener than it was historically. That's because we have removed the cattle from this area. We've planted trees. We've restored the land. And the forest is beginning to come back. So who is the we? My organization, SavingSpecies.org, raise the money. We gave that money to a Brazilian NGO, the Golden Lion Tamarin Association, who bought the land and then handed that land over to the Instituto Chica Mendez, essentially the Brazilian Park Service. The Tamarin Association is also doing these plantings, so you can see the forest coming back at really quite a, a remarkable rate. And we use child labor. <laughs> the consequence of this is that the area shown in red was a nature reserve. We bought the area in blue, connected it to the mainland of forest. Um, and the Brazilian authorities, since they now own the red stuff and the blue stuff, decided that since nobody could cut the forest on the area outlined in yellow, would make the entire area into a protected area. It's the largest bit of lowland rainforest in coastal Brazil, in fact, in this hotspot. I found out appropriately on Earth Day a couple of weeks ago that we had found a puma poop in the corridor, meaning that predators are moving into that isolated island and the golden lion tamarins, which had been imprisoned in that little patch of forest, are now crossing it and going forth and multiplying. At least they damn well better. <laughs> this holiday season, think of carbon in the most beautiful form. Diamonds are beautiful, but this year, think of giving her some carbon that's even more valuable. Sequester her carbon in tropical rainforest. For very little money, you can offset your carbon footprint by restoring key habitats in some of the most biologically diverse areas of the world. Visit SavingSpecies.org. Uh, we Christians, as you probably know, are into absolving people of sin. So I sell indulgences. I can absolve you of your carbon sin for a mere $70. I haven't learned yet from my, uh, from my Jewish son-in-law exactly what your philosophy is about absolving sin. On the other hand, he, he and my daughter uh, do give to saving species, so I have some hope. I think the takeaway lessons of this, we, the scientific community, can clearly identify the critical areas where species are going extinct. 
We need to do that. We need to have better taxonomy, more complete taxonomy. We need to know where to act. Once we've got there, that's not enough. We need to find mechanisms through the ecosystem services that I outlined to protect the habitats from further destruction, and particularly when those habitats have become fragmented, to restore them and restore that connectivity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Finn, Professor Finn, for giving us so much homework. We have a lot of time to work for it. Thank you. Thank you for all those who organized this wonderful day. Very interesting day. Thank you for all the professors who lectured. And thank you for the audience. Come back soon. Thank you very much.